it is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing the undisputed heavyweight champion of Dentaltown, Dr. Philip Stephen Zelmanow, DDS, with 60,000 posts, and his protege, Dr. Gregory Jan Atwood, DDS. Um, Phillips from that Northeast corridor, if you live around the world for our international viewers, the United States um, in that Upper East corner between Washington, D.C. and Boston is a super megalopolis of like 50 million people, and Steve's right on the top of that edge. And then Greg's out in the middle of uh, the greatest state in the universe, Texas, where four of my six grandchildren live. So uh, it doesn't get better than that. So Phil earned his dental degree from Tufts University School of Dental Medicine after earning his bachelor's degree from from SUNY Albany. He has taken numerous postgraduate education courses, specifically selecting courses focusing on full mouth rehab. Recent training in restore, restoration and complex implant cases allows him to give back patients rock solid replacements for missing teeth. He is constantly evaluating emerging dental methods and technologies in order to provide his patients with the best results with a high emphasis on comfort. He is honored to have been named a Connecticut Magazine top dentist for years 2009. 10, 11, 13, 15, 16. Gregory Jan Atwood was raised in a small town in southern Alberta, Canada, as the fourth of seven children. I didn't even know they let foreigners in Texas. They let a Canadian move down to Texas. What are they doing? He grew up involved in church and sports and played high school basketball. Two of his older sisters were dental assistants, which may have influenced his decision to pursue a career in dentistry. He earned his DDS degree from the University of Alberta. While there, he completed the U.S. board exams and earned awards for the student with the greatest potential in fixed prosthodontics and orthodontics. He worked for two years at a dental practice in Alberta, but both winters were long with periods of temperatures minus 67 Fahrenheit. Um, the Atwoods decided to look for work further south. He got licensed for Texas and moved to Midland, where he practiced from 2005 through 2011. In January 2012, Atwood purchased the practice of Dr. James Edmondson, who has been practicing Odessa for well over 30 years. He enjoys learning and regularly takes uh, more than required amounts of continued education, including several courses in orthodontics. He also enjoyed his dental mission trip to Costa Rica. Dr. Atwood and his wife, Jamie, are the parents of five wonderful children who keep them very busy with soccer, volleyball, basketball, piano, violin, scouting, church, school, and various other activities. Being a family man has helped shape the focus of his dental practice. He offers services for the entire family Family with a conservative and preventive approach, he tries to treat each patient the way he would want a member of the family treated, which means he's trustworthy, loyal, friendly, helpful, thrifty, clean, brave, and reverent. Oh, pretty close. Ah, pretty close, but uh, yeah. no, no I have to ask one of my two Eagle Scouts to get it right. Oh my gosh, it's been a uh, been my, many many years since I was a <laughs> Scout, but uh, my gosh. Uh, Thanks for coming on, Phil. I feel like I'm uh, in a podcast interviewing Mick Jagger right now. You've got you've got to be if you're not Mick Jagger of Dentaltown, who is with sixty thousand posts. I think I'd go with maybe Matthew McMasters. I think okay. he he might be the guy. I might be second fiddle to him. Oh my gosh! Well, that is uh, one hell of a band. Uh, I feel like I mean seriously. I I don't um. I don't know how old you are or whatever. I don't know if you're, if I feel like my dad, my brother, my uncle, my cousin, but uh, my God, I feel like, I feel like I know everything about you. But, um, so how are you gentlemen doing today? I'm, I'm well, thank you. Doing so, pretty well. So let's start with the big, obvious 4,000 pound elephant coronavirus. Um, does it kind it kind of looks like I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. It, it looks like it's over. I mean, I've got both of my vaccine vaccinations. Everybody I know does. You see, no. Uh, we went to a movie uh, Sunday night. We went to a movie theater. How weird is that? I hadn't had popcorn in uh, a movie theater. It just seems like it's over. But when you read the international news, my gosh, uh, even European countries, India, Pakistan, Brazil, it's still a nightmare. But what's it look like on the ground to you as far as um, how close are you to pre-pandemic um, versus post-pandemic? Go ahead, Phil. Um, well, I think in Connecticut, we're not quite there. You know, I think this is very much a regional thing, the way people feel. We're still, we've obviously been vaccinated being dentists, but people are still much more cautious here than they are out where you are, I would think, Howard. We, I, don't, I don't even know if movie theaters are open. I'm not even sure, but we still have some pretty good restrictions in restaurants and stuff. No concerts, nothing like that going on. 
Well, Arizona is factually the Florida of the West. So um, even at the scariest time when everybody should be home, I think traffic only decreased 20%. So so uh, four out of five people um, thought it was a, uh, an extreme overreaction or whatever. So uh, it may be different down here. So so um, we're, um, you don't have to get personal, but where would your office numbers be, say, um, um, you know, before pandemic afterwards, are you, um, you know, we were all closed for two months and had to have a donut for two months in a row, but are you, how far back percentage wise are you to pre pandemic numbers? We're all the way back. All the way. Yeah. And Greg, what about you? Yeah. So, so for us, we actually, it hit us pretty hard on an oil country and, and of course oil got clobbered when the pandemic hit in. And so, there's a lot of unemployment and uh, just things really slowed down out here, which which hurt us last year. But um, last month was actually a record month for our office, and this month is right on track with that one. So, so we've definitely picked back up now that things have rebounded as far as uh, the local economy. Well, you know it, that's a, that's a great um, economic lesson. I mean, there's there's external shocks that are beyond your business, and it can be you know war, it could be um, a pandemic, and uh, but Texas is massively Texas, Louisiana, and Oklahoma are massively overweighted in oil, mm-hmm. and where oil goes, so goes Texas, and it got all the way down to what twenty dollars a barrel, but it's all the way back up to sixty. So I mean, that's a that's a threefold jump um, lately. Um, does that give you optimism that that? Yeah, oil shock I mean, it was, it, it was minus forty something la- last year. So you know, we're up almost a hundred dollars a barrel from the low, and yeah, things pretty much shut down. I, I'm right where there's drilling all around me and stuff. Most of my, almost everybody in my area is linked to the oil industry. I just tell people I'm here doing a different kind of drilling. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but anyway, we, we we've rebounded well, and the economy locally is doing well now. Uh, as far as pandemic, uh, Texas is pretty open. I'm I'm sure you're aware of that I was in Colorado this last weekend, and things are a lot different there than they are here, as far as restrictions in restaurants and things like that. And then my family back in Canada, it's I mean, it's like the pandemic's just starting there. It seems like they're really really slow down there. Well, I, I was not expecting um, the United States to get an A plus on the rollout. I mean, all the initial reactions and all that, all the controversies and all that stuff. But man, when you look at how America rolled out the vaccine compared to every other country, I mean, it's basically just the U.S. and Israel were the only two countries that just they they got an A plus in rolling it out. Uh, I, I I did not see that coming. What did you think? I mean, as far as the vaccine rollout here, it's been pretty good. I think almost everybody who wants one, I mean, they're starting to actually, I got a, a message this week that they're starting to do it at the high schools locally for the high school kids now, because pretty much everybody else who's wanted it can get it in my area. So now, Phil, you, um, or um, Greg, you have uh, five children and you're a dentist. You got a doctorate, science, all that. Are you planning on vaccinating all of your children? Yeah, all, all of them that are old enough, my, I have one that's 14 and they're not giving it to um, anybody under 16, I think right now in our area, but my, I have a 17 year old, he got it. So, so, so your 17 yeah, year old got it, but the other four haven't. No, no the other ones have, um, I'm just saying the everyone who's old enough is getting yeah. it. Yeah. I have one that's not old. They're not giving it to under 16 yet, but everyone else has got it. So, Phil, how old are your children? 19 and 21. They both received their first dose of vaccination and waiting on the second. Well, if you guys were, um, it, but when patients come into your office, when, when they extend this vaccine, I mean, got a newborn baby. I mean, they give them all kinds of vaccines, uh, the, the vaccine dose. Um, so, you know, as soon as it gets approved, they're going to, um, they'll do it for that age. But uh, would you recommend that for babies at this point or, you know, the normal children's vaccination schedule? I don't get into um, too much debate about vaccination with patients. It's sort of one of those hot topics. But my feeling is, and all I say is, I think you've got to sort of decide whether you're either going to get the vaccine or you're probably going to get the virus at some point in time and pick your poison. And that, that, so it was an easy decision for me and for my children. 
Well, my gosh, you just um, you just walked my mind into a door. We just had um, one of the most amazing dentists on uh, Dental Town die from oral cancer, and um, uh, which brings up the question of the vaccine Gardasil. I mean, um, I mean, I I've been posting about Gardasil on Dental Town forever, and it just gets no traction. And I was kind of hoping that you know that maybe um, a global pandemic about a virus and talking about a vaccine um, would really bring um, uh, the HPV vaccine to the top of the schedule. I don't know where Greg's at in Texas. Um, the, the governor there, it was, blew my mind when it first came out, he wanted to make it mandatory for everyone in school and the pushback almost pushed him down an oil well and then fracked on top of him. Um, do you think, um, uh, you said you don't want to talk about vaccines with the patients. I don't like talking about religion, sex, politics, violence, all that stuff. But do you think Gardasil, um, do, do you think dentists are not doing their job when um, oral cancer survival rate hasn't moved since, you know, 50 years? It's still like 5%, five-year survival rate. And we just, um, Manu's uh, sister is a periodontist, and she just posted uh, the other day, she just posted um Thanks, Howard, for bringing this up. It is time we as dentists rose up with regards to not only getting the respect as doctors, but certain procedures. We were asked to close during the start of the COVID, but liquor stores were essential. How does that make sense? On and on and on. But she says, we are not trained at all with dealing with talking to patients about oral sex and transmission diseases, yet we are obligated to do so for sexual abuse cases. We should be talking about this more. There needs to be a change in school. It took a year of child abuse and neglect training and lots of SVU episodes for me to know how we dentists play a role in it all. We are not talking, especially um, to our young, about HPV. Uh, so so where, where does that... Um, um, where do, where does where do you think of that? Take it away, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, Phil, my gosh. I, I I I honestly I don't get into that too much with patients either. I mean, some of those are sensitive issues that people have feelings on. I mean, if I had a patient specifically ask me uh, about it or whatnot, I'm a, I might mention something but that's not something i normally get into i'm sure phil has a better answer than that well it, it, it's it's incredible because i mean um i loved him and um we put uh manu on the cover of dental town everything but he was a 31 year old kid he had no risk factor i mean no smoking drinking all, all those types of things that you associate with oral cancer i mean he clearly had a uh, i mean to me it's obviously had an HPV infection and got oral cancer and died. And, and on dental town, um, my gosh, it's just, they, they don't talk about the importance of, uh, that if you don't get this, um, when you're this vaccine, when you're young, there's, it causes a lot of cancer, not just oral, but mm-hmm. remember Farrah Fawcett when we were little, any, you mm-hmm. guys remember she died oh, yeah. of anal Charlie's cancer. Angels. Yeah. She died mm-hmm. of anal cancer, which is an HPV infection. Um, but, uh, uh, well, I don't want to, uh, degrade the, uh, uh, this podcast we're talking about uh, just oral sex and HPV and all those things <laughs> like that. Uh, but so, so what's on your uh, your guys' mind now, Phil? You got to have the best pulse on Dental Town with sixty thousand posts. You you probably see this U.S. dental industry uh, more clearly than anybody. How how's it looking to you now? So I my wife Samantha is my partner in dentist. We're we're actually retiring. Our last day of work is June thirtieth. So my life has really been focused on that for like the last, I don't know, eight to 12, eight, maybe eight months or so, finding our replacement and all that stuff. So as far as the like, finger on the pulse of dentistry, I don't know. I've sort of, I've sort of switched gears. I'm sort of in a, um, uh, uh, an exiting mindset more than, than I am of predicting the future of dentistry. I, I don't know. You know, I joined MB2, you know, and, and Greg's with MB2 as well, because I thought I was a little concerned about the future of dentistry, about corporate you know, influx in dentistry and how that would affect things. And I saw myself as sort of a small potato being sort of overrun. And it's one of the reasons why I joined MB2. So will that continue? I think that's the great question. We just don't know. That's where my mind was. So you're going to retire when? June 30th. I have, June 30th I have at what age? 51. Wow. Wow. So how's that feel? Um, so um, is going to retire June 30th at age 51. That's it. That's the plan. I mean, how many dentists do you know 
on Dentaltown that um, you know, starts saying, I mean, they're only out of school like five years. They start planning for retirement, and you're there at 51. I mean, that's that's a remarkable accomplishment. Uh, um, so you join MB2, and, and by the way, the pandemic, it took a pandemic to make a lot of major changes. Like, it took a pandemic to get me off lecturing. I mean, I lectured 32 to 64 cities a year for 30 years, and I loved to lecture, and I hated the traveling, and it took a pandemic, and, and now that it, everything's open back up, everybody's like, oh, sign, come lecture here. It's like, are you kidding me? It took a damn pandemic to get off, and after a year of not doing it, there's no way I'm driving to Sky Harbor to get in an airplane to fly to Connecticut and sleep in a Holiday Inn to get up and talk to 200 people when we can talk to 10,000 right now. Um, but um, it took a pandemic to turn the DSO image upside down. I mean, I remember Dentaltown had always had about 1,000 offices for sale and about 4,000 jobs, and most of the jobs were in DSOs. Pandemic came, and the 1,000 offices for sale doubled to 2,000, and the 4,000 jobs shrank to 1,000 of only the largest DSOs. And Mm. I think it took a pandemic for dentists to realize that animals find safety in numbers, especially herd animals. And do you think um, the DSO brand um, has made a huge pivot uh, towards up after this pandemic? I don't think I mean, it's hurt. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Rick Workman tells me, I mean, his phone's ringing off the wall. I mean, it's just, uh, I mean, they, they can't fish through these offers fast enough because they're still buying they're still doing M&A activity, whereas like Aspen, um, you know, they they build their own stores. And, they're you know, that's a completely different strategy. But I, I think it helped a lot. Are you thinking about maybe going into management at MB2? Me, myself? Yeah. I mean, no. 51, all the leadership, been there, done that at so many levels. Um, you know, right now I'm not thinking about much of anything, actually. So Sam and I are uh, we're moving to Florida probably in October. So we're, we're sort of focused on setting up our life there. And right now we don't really have plans. Would I, would I ever work for MB2? I, I consider it, I guess. I love the company. They've been great to me. And I've only seen pretty much great things from it. So I guess it's something I would consider, but just not right now. Yeah. And uh, Greg, are you planning on retiring too? Or did or did the five kid, uh, when you passed, <laughs> I only had four kids because I knew if you passed the four kid and went to five, <laughs> Uh, you're going to work till you're 65. Uh, are, do you have the same goal of retiring? Yeah, actually. So I had planned on an early retirement from, I was one of those five year out guys that did want a, an early retirement. And I always thought kind of I'd do it on my own. And uh, there's a few things unique to my practice. I do some ortho. I'm in kind of a, a smaller area, kind of out in the middle of Texas and and I started thinking that when the time comes to transition out, it could be a difficult transition just with a solo doctor. Not everybody does ortho. Not everybody's going to want to come out to this part of West Texas. But um, there's actually a pretty strong local MB2 presence with MB2 partners locally. And one of them, one of the doctors had introduced me to MB2. And, and I finally decided, decided to listen to him. And and it seemed to fit. The nice thing about MB2 is, is they support doctors uh, with whatever their goal is. I mean, they find successful practices to partner with, but Phil and I are kind of the exception. I, I, I thought everybody who partnered with MB2 was kind of wanting to transition out of dentistry and maybe go towards a retirement. But what I found when I partnered was we we're actually the exception. Most people are younger than us and wanting to grow or just want some, or maybe they built something big and just want some help managing it. Um, so, but yeah, my, my goal is to kind of transition out of dentistry uh, and, and do an early retirement. But, but we're, we're really kind of the exception when it comes to MBT doctors. That was a big surprise to me as well. Actually, I thought it'd be filled with, dentist looking to retire and it's really not the case greg's right it's not the case at all well what what is the case well it's just like what he said it's all you know if you're growing a booming practice and you need a million dollars of liquidity to to fund a growth or you want to open another practice and you but you're not quite prepared to do it on your own having a corporation and their support back you I, I guess makes it a lot more comforting and a lot easier and maybe a lot smoother. And there are a lot of people doing that in MB2. I was shocked. I didn't realize that was part of it as well because that was never my goal. But for a lot of sort of what I call gunners, that's what they're doing. 
Um, do you do you think um, it's a significantly different model? I mean, I, I had the founder on the show. Um, do you think um, how if some young kid, uh, a quarter of our listeners are still stuck in dental kindergarten school, and I, I feel your pain. Um, but and they're, they're, they get out, they you know they see the brand DSO. But um, what would you say is uniquely different of MB two versus say the other big boys of uh, Aspen, Heartland, or um, um, Pacific Dental, what have you? You know, I spoke. I, I spoke with Rick actually a few months ago. He called me. He saw something that I wrote about MB two on Dental Town, as a matter of fact. And we we spent twenty minutes or a half hour speaking. Nice guy, by the way. It's hard to say because I only know MB two. You know, I've never worked for Heartland or any of these other places. You know, my experience with MB two is they really are a support organization that I've never. They they rely on the doctor on the ground to make the calls. So if I want to give somebody a bonus or we want to take this day off or we want to buy that, I've, I've been with MB2 for just a little over a year, year and a half maybe. And I've never, I'm trying to think, I've never had an instance where I thought something was a good idea that I ran by them that they said no. They really, I, I think they, Greg said it, they, they acquire offices that are run well and profitable and they want to support that. So I always say they don't buy a mom and pop hamburger shop and try and turn it into McDonald's. They don't want you to sell Big Macs. They want you to do what you do. So that's what's it's seemingly unique to me to MB2. But you know, again, I've never worked for Heartland or any of these other outfits. And and what are the what is what are they trying to look for? Do they have minimum requirements and money, operatory, square foot, hours, number of dentists? What what, are, what is their ideal uh, slam dunk purchase when they're in M and A mood? I I. I th- Great. Do you know, I don't, I don't know if that's sort of a, a changing metric. I know at one point they were looking for practices that grossed at least a million dollars. So they don't want tiny practices. You no know, million dollars is what I yeah, th- yeah, yeah, that's what my understanding. I think, you know, minimum gross collections of a million. They like five, to six ops or more. Um, uh, I, I'm sure they, once, once they get past the initial things and they look at numbers, obviously, uh, you know, profitability is, is big, not just the gross, but if there's 95% overhead, then there's not much left over. So you want to look at, you know, how the practices run and all the metrics there, but there is, there are minimum requirements. Not They're, they're not going to jump at every practice. They're actually, I think they said at one point in time that of, of uh, every 10 offices that they're introduced to, I think they, they, basically pick one. So they're actually pretty selective as well. Yeah. So see their phones are ringing off the wall. They, they, they're taking one out of 10. I mean, um, yeah. Rick, Rick says he can't even return all the phone calls to people that want to sell. Um, does, so two months ago, they changed hands. Um, private equity firm, uh, Sentinel sold MB2. And, uh, now, um, um, Charles capital partners acquired it, uh, two months ago. Um, Greg, um, Phil's getting ready to retire in a couple months and you're, how long do you plan on working there? I probably have another year or so. I've already, you know, talked to the people there and I'm kind of working on a transition out over the next year. And then what will you do when you transition out? We're, we're going to move to uh, an area outside of Zion National Park in Southern Utah. I'm going to do a lot of hiking and mountain biking and and uh, I have, I've done some investing that's done pretty well, enough to kind of cover our needs. And I just want to do other things. I may get into some writing, which I did a little bit before, and get back into that. But kind of like Phil, I'll just take some time to figure it all out. Well, it makes sense. You went all the way from Alberta to Costa Rica, back up to Texas, <laughs> and now you're going to go up to Utah. Um, who was that guy who wrote, um, um, who, who was the... Um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He he Steve died. Covey. He died mountain biking up in Utah. He fell off his uh, mountain bike, and I, I'm right by a bunch of mountains. And I've always wondered forever, um, what's more dangerous uh, on the street or mountain biking? And all my <laughs> friends that do both say you just got to decide if you want to uh, get ran over by a truck or eat a sore or a cactus. Either way, <laughs> you're going to die. So I guess uh, both both are dead. It's just how you choose your death. Um, but the, um, the one thing that, um, you know, um, like when you're in Costa Rica, I mean, obviously what separates the hundred poor countries from the 20 richest countries in one word is just stability. And mm-hmm. you just, you just can't, 
attract um, capital and international investments and employ. You can't do anything when it's chaos and you're in unstable times. Um, do you think that's um, a big reason uh, the private equity firms uh, sold just two months ago? Because the stock market is anything but stability. I mean, I'm not uh, an economist, but I do have an MBA, and I, I I, I can't even understand the metrics of Wall Street anymore. I mean, when you look at price earnings of like Tesla at 1500 so if you bought it at the fall of the Roman Empire, you still wouldn't have got your money back. Um, do you think, um, and you're talking about your investments, um, are you worried about your investments in this market? Or do you, or is gravity? I feel like, yeah, I mean, I definitely was last year. I feel like I'm pretty diversified. I have some invested in, you know, stocks, bonds, and then I also have uh, some pretty significant real estate, um, rental properties. And then I actually reinvested uh, a fair amount back into MB2 as well, So, uh, which partner doctors can do. So I feel like between all of that, I'm a little more calm because I feel like, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly well diversified or about as diversified as, as I, as I can be. Well, the money you've invested in, um, MB2, that, that's a great question because, um, you know, the, the only thing Wall Street provides is liquidity. Um, before Wall Street, if you're, if you inherited 10 shares of a company, uh, from your grandpa, you would actually have to find a person to buy them from you. And, um, right now these, um, these people that own, uh, um, shares of uh, companies that aren't uh, publicly traded, the liquidity is a huge factor. In fact, when people say that if you would have bought an ounce of gold at the time of uh, uh, Jesus, it wouldn't have gone up in value, it's like, give me a break. That, that All that means is the transaction cost ate all gains. That's all it means. It doesn't have anything to do with value. Um, it has to do with transaction costs. But do you think um, the new partners or down the road, do you expect to see any of these DSOs publicly traded on NASDAQ? I would think so. You would think so? Yeah, I would think at some point in time, you know, they, they sort of hop between private equity companies and, and, you know, you would think at one point you'd be so big that there wouldn't be a, a private equity company big enough to shell out the kind of money that it would take to acquire the company. Just my guess. That a company, let's say Heartland right now is probably one of the biggest. I mean, mm-hmm. is there another, you know, they were bought out by, the Canadian, is it the Canadian Teachers Union? Um, it was some Canadian teachers, but then they sold it to KKR. Okay, KKR, that's what it is. I mean, is there, a, if they grow and let's say doubled in size, is there another private equity company big enough to acquire them then or would they have to go public? But next time you talk to Rick, you can ask him that question, I guess. Well, it, it, it to me, um, everybody that I talk to on or off the record, it's kind of like um, the Dodd-Frank bill when, um, you know, you had that 2008 Lehman's Day. And, of course, the banks were the bad guys because they loaned poor people money. Isn't it funny how the narrative just goes? I, I, I thought poor people, um, we should help them. And, but anyway, they, they loaned too much money to poor people. So they wrote all this banking regulation. And uh, so then all the... Um, FinTech said, okay, well, then we're obviously not going to be a bank. So they went with high net worth investors and, and it's all back with zero regulation. Um, it's kind of like after uh, World War II, the reparations on Germany were so intense that it forced them to attack their neighbors for resources. And that's why after World War II, they did not do repar- um, uh, make them uh, reparations. They actually did a huge investment in them. But I, I think they... Um, the regulations of Wall Street from the government are so intense um, that they just love the private equity. You, you trade off liquidity for no regulation, so they, they're just they're more free. Um, Who do I? I feel like I'm getting an education lesson today. <laughs> Stock market <laughs> investing. <laughs> I'm um, a biology major with no 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 business training, so I'm listening. Well, well, let, let's go back to the Bismarck. I mean, the only thing I care about, because I'm just a selfish bastard, is um, my six grandchildren. I mean, you know, I, I get it, the circle life. I mean, as soon as one of my six grandchildren has a baby, I, I know I'm dead. And I just want, um, you know, I, I just want dentistry, the sovereign profession of dentistry that's two centuries old, um, to be managed so that if one of my grandchildren goes to the dentist, um, the dentist treats them like they want to be treated. Do you, do you feel um, that that's solid with MB2? I, I do. I, I, I honestly, I, I my my patients have no idea I've partnered with MB2. They will see zero difference. My staff really 
I mean, they get a few more benefits, I guess. And, um, but, but other than that, like they really don't know the difference. My practice is essentially run the same from, you know, what, a, what a patient sees it's still Atwood family dental. It's still me. We run the same schedule, use the same materials I was using before use the same lab. Um, I mean, that part of it really hasn't changed. So, uh, I, I think, you know, it will, every doctor will have the choice as to how they want to treat their patients, but I've had no requirements from MB2 to run anything differently than I already was. Don't you think that what would change that if something's going to change it? I don't think it, I think maybe I, maybe I, at one time I thought it would be corporations that would change that, but now I'm thinking it's more insurance companies and their negative pressure on, on fees. And then if the government steps in, then sort of all bets are off. So when you're asking what the future holds, well, I guess it depends on what the insurance companies do. And like I said, maybe if the government steps into this, because if the government steps in, it's going to change it radically. And, and do, do you think, um, are you expecting that? Do you think the government will step in? Beats the hell out of me. I mean, they're already the largest employer. I mean, it's, I mean, um, my gosh, uh, a lot of people, every, every time I see the press say Walmart's the largest employer, I'm like, are you out of your mind? The yeah. federal government employees like 14 out of every 100 people and you're talking about walmart <clears throat> so they they have a history of um taking everything over they can um it would be interesting but um what if the government got involved in, in medicare and, and gave senior citizens dental care and it was the government that was doing it think how oh, that would change i mean i have a lot of patients over the age of 65 and what if all of their their you know the money for their dental work came from the government. Well, that changes things pretty radically in my practice. I, I, personally, I'd be surprised. I mean, I'm from Canada and they've had socialized medicine there for all of my lifetime. And, and but dentistry is not socialized like that. It's not overseen by the government. So I think if we transition that way in, in the United States, I think it'll be a gradual transition, probably starting with medicine. And then dentistry would be way after that if it ever comes along. That would be my guess. I mean, it's pretty amazing. You know, the government has 24 million employees and Walmart has 1.8 million employees. And everybody always talks about Walmart being the largest employer because they don't want you to realize that the government um, to feed its 24 million people. Uh, but actually, um, Canada, where you were born, is the reason why all these um uh, socialized medicine countries don't cover dentistry. It was a public health uh, dentist legend back in the day said, uh, look, dentistry is a preventable disease. You, you drink Coca-Cola instead of water and you don't brush and floss. And, um, and it's largely because of that, that uh, a lot of these uh, companies don't uh, cover it. But, but it. but that's a whole nother issue because all these benefits, I feel like um, it's a fantasy because right now you're hearing people saying that student loans should be paid off and universal health care. And I, I get it. I mean, obviously, free stuff is good. You don't have to be uh, Newton's uh, son to know that uh, people like free stuff. But but with $23 trillion of debt, the only rate, way they can manage that is with interest rates set to zero. Um, but if our currency which has been falling, commodity prices are rising, um, uh, look at real estate prices have shot up, that, that, that's not from value, that, that's all inflation. Uh, when lumber's up and commodities and corn and oil, I mean, oil's gone from 20 to 60. Out here in Arizona, we're in a pandemic. Everything was closed. The construction starts plummeted. Uh, yet housing prices shot up twenty percent, and this is the lowest year of uh, um, population growth we've seen. Um, I, you have to be as old as me. I mean, the last time I saw inflation was nineteen eighty when I graduated from high school. Uh, that was um, you know I was born in sixty two, and inflation is a monster. And Paul Volcker, the Fed chairman of the Federal Reserve had to raise interest rates to, um, I mean, like 20 and a half percent to break that inflation or they would lose the reserve currency status. And the United States isn't prepared to hand this over the reserve currency to China or the Euro. And if you, and those interest rates even went halfway back up, you wouldn't have the money for any of these programs. I mean, it would be horrible times. And that's why I wonder, um, I wonder if uh, that's why MB2 sold, is to get out on the top of the mountain because God only knows what this economy is going to do. That'd be a better question for their CEO. But my, my thought is no, because I think they'd always planned on the recap 
uh, all along, and they're already telling us that probably in another four years, there'll be another recapitalization where they partner with another private equity partner. I mean, that's just part of the transition process that they they go along. So uh, again, uh, Dr. Villanueva could probably answer that a lot better than I can, but but uh, I mean, for for the years, they anticipated another recapitalization happening, happening around this time. It happened a few months ago, and they're anticipating another one happening in about four years or so. Well, I love Chris, but man, I'd like to talk to the new uh, Michael uh, Coe, the managing director and CEO of Charles Bank with his Harvard University. He even has a BA in biology. Maybe that's why he's interested in this. If you, if you got any connections to get that man on the show, I would love for him to come on the show and tell me why he bought it and what he thinks the value is, the value creation will be. Um, but back to the kids stuck in dental kindergarten school. Um, you know, they last year they graduated in a pandemic, and in another month, um, there's two dental schools in my backyard. There's AT Still in Mesa, and there's Midwestern where I'm lecturing tonight um, at Six in Glendale. What would your message be to these young kids coming out four hundred thousand dollars in student loans? That's a different shock um, that than most of us had when we got out of school. Um, but what would you tell them as they're coming out of school? Like, give me my lecture that I'm supposed to tell them tonight. They're coming out of school, $400,000 in debt in two months. Um, what would you tell them? And and what do you think uh, their, their, this profession is going to look like for them when they're your age? I'm just, I'm just, I can't imagine. So I have a 21 year old and a 19 year old and, and I would do everything I could to, unless it was a, a just a, a pure passion for them, but to come out of school with upwards of a half million dollars worth of debt, I can't fathom that. I, I don't really have advice for those. You know, put your nose down and work hard, but man, that is one hell of a nut to crack in any profession, even one as great as, you know, dentistry where you can earn good money. I, I don't know. I, I, I guess find a job where you can work hard and, and make enough money and start paying down your loans. And besides that, I don't know what else you could tell them. Well, you didn't tell them your other advantage. Not only did you, how many much student loans did you have back in the day? I think between Sam and I, we were about a quarter of a million dollars. And that was back in, we graduated in 95. But the thing I noticed, what you did, I, I still think the most genius move in dental school is to marry a classmate like you did. Hmm. I mean, um, when you have two similar people get married in the same postgraduate degree, the divorce rate's like 10%. I mean, I don't care if it's two lawyers, doctors, whatever. If you have a postgraduate degree, the same as your spouse, you have, you're on the same page in so many ways. And instead of, um, and, and, and you're married to someone where each person is making $10,000 a month. I mean, um, what advice would you give? How were you able to trick Samantha into marriage uh, at Tufts? Did you uh, do all of her lab work for free? Did you let her cheat off your exams? Tell us your strategy of how you made this genius financial move at Tufts. Just that smooth of a guy, Howard. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. Um, yeah, it's a pretty idyllic situation. I mean, yeah, I mean, I highly recommend marrying another dentist. It's it certainly served us, not not just economically, but lifestyle-wise. I mean, I, I've got to play Mr. Mom, and I, 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 I've only worked two days a week for the last, I don't know, probably pushing 15 years. We split one practice. We decided early on that instead of having two dental practices, we would sort of split one. And it's allowed us to have a pretty amazing lifestyle. So it's been pretty amazing for us, for sure. So there's my advice. Marry, find somebody in dental school and get married. But statistically, really, Samantha married you, not the other way. Because the women, if the, if the women have an MD, a DDS, a CPA, whatever, they always marry across the profession on up. It's the males who you'd say, well, that, that girl's a lawyer. And you say, and they say, yeah, but check out that chick at the Waffle House. Did you see that new waitress? She is so hot. And uh, it just seems like women marry with their brains and men uh, marry with their brains. If you are talking about uh, Neanderthal, Cro-Magnum, Homo habilis, whatever brain. Uh, but my gosh, I, I just think uh, um, marrying a fellow colleague, um, I, I've just seen nothing but the, is, is, I, I think it's probably the single best move. Like when people say, well, do you think I should specialize? I say, yeah, after you marry one of the girls in your class, uh, marry a girl in your class, then specialize. And now Greg's saying, uh, wait a minute, Greg, you're, you're the opposing view. Um, you did not marry a classmate in dental school. Are you <clears throat> regretting it? 
What's wrong no, with you, right? no, no regrets. <laughs> you know, it probably would have helped financially. Two days a week does sound pretty nice, but uh, no, it's worked out. We're happily married. Twenty going on twenty six years this year, so we're doing well. Wow, that's amazing. And um, I also noticed I'm I'm down here in a retirement place. I mean, um, you know, I'm uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Ten percent of the of the housing flip every year is to Canadians. Uh, this is just Canada south and a lot of the arizonans and canadians went down to rocky point to retire or costa rica you did a mission in costa rica and i just keep running into people who came back because it's um they say that the 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 prices have gone off the charts they said it's game theory where the people know you're an an expat so if you walk up to a fruit stand, uh, if you're born in Costa Rica, you might get it for one X. Uh, but if they know you're an expat, it's already two or three. Um, what what are you? Um, are you hearing any of that? Do you still have any connections down in Costa Rica? No, my my time in Costa Rica was just a one week dental mission trip. It wasn't like the full full like a church big big long church mission or anything like that. I did serve one of those, but that wasn't in Costa Rica. So. My my time in Costa Rica was limited to just a, a little dental mission trip. And Phil, can we say that um, you retired after winning the thousand dollar grand prize uh, for the Tony Choice Awards? Is that, that the real? That was key in my decision making process. That was key. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that you that won one anyway, Howard. That one thousand dollars really pushed you over the edge, huh? That was uh, you just needed one thousand more, and you could retire, and uh, it was done. Um, so back back to the kids, um, um, you know, Dennis, the, the, the specialty of dentistry was created by Pierre Fichard. It's a specialty of medicine. All the specialties that Dennis calls specialties are actually subspecialties of dentistry, which is a specialty of medicine. It's 200 years old, and most of the hallmarks of that, um, they just um, grow a little bit faster than the economy when the economy is growing, like maybe one and a half percent more. But when the economy is shrinking, it acts like a luxury good. It's like, you know, when, when you're worried about money, you don't take cruises. That industry has been decimated. Um, you put off bleaching, boning. But the only areas that are growing double digit around the globe are clear liners because of Invisalign and um, blood and guts implant surgery. And um, do you think um, when these kids come out of school, if you're not going to specialize and you're going to be a general dentist, do you think you're going to have to get good at one of those two things or not so much? I think it kind of depends where you are. I mean, you asked earlier what advice you would give. I actually have a brother that graduated from dental school maybe three years ago and a nephew that graduated about a year ago, and they asked me advice. And I, I mean, the first thing I would say when you're in the hole, like some of these kids you're going to be talking to are, you know, 400, 500,000. I'd say don't live like a dentist for the first little while. Remember, live like you're still a student because, I mean, you might be making good money, but you're not worth a whole lot right now. So, you know, live frugally. And then I would say for your first associateship, try to find a job where you're replacing an associate that was doing really well. Um, and look at the numbers. Don't don't be somebody's first associate and think you're going to be killing it. You know, uh, look for somebody where you're replacing another associate that was killing it, and maybe he moved on to ownership or whatever. And look at the numbers and try to get that job and 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 get good at a little bit of everything. Get good at your bread and butter stuff first, and then get confident with that, and then get into maybe the clear aligners or some limited ortho. Uh, implants or those those other things. Um, that would be my advice. And then and then and then you know when it comes to ownership or or a partnership, kind of like what Phil and I are in now. Look at the numbers. I mean, I, I had a lot of classmates go into a practice and it would just be a beautiful practice, maybe a lot of high tech stuff, and they would think this is the practice I want. And they'd look at the numbers and. The numbers would be, well, by the time you make your student loan payments and your practice loan payment, there's not much left. So, you know, look at the practice numbers and, and find a practice or a partnership situation or something, that, you know, that's going to allow you to get out. You know, um, I asked you for what advice um, you would give these uh, dental students tonight when I talked to them at Midwestern. But uh, I really like the advice you gave at your children's um 
marriage. I mean, you know, it seems like so many <laughs> millennials are like, um, well, you know, I want to find something where, you know, that I'm passionate about and I love and, and then I'll never have to work another day in life. It's like, dude, look, humans are 200,000 years old. They've lived through two ice ages. They had to spend entire winters in caves eating mastodon shit. Um, there's, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you that life's not like that. And you were telling your, um, uh, your, your son when he got married that it's not about a spark or a flame. It's about a long-term commitment of building your family. It's not warm. It's not always warm and fuzzy. It's a it's a serious thing, and like um, a spark or a fire. And that that's why I tell these kids when they come out of school. I mean, if you were graduating from med school and you had to go work at an ER, and someone comes in from a head-on car wreck, it's not the time to wondering is this job everything you meant it to be? Are you feeling passionate? Are you, are you feeling lovey-dovey, sparky? It's like, dude, it's a war. It, two cars tried to kill each other, and I need you to take the beach. Um, it's kind of, uh, do you see that too? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you need to be practical, and, you know, that that, that was something I just actually posted today. It looks like you, someone hit you up on that. It was my daughter's wedding this last weekend, so... So yeah, somebody had asked me in dental school if my wife and I still had a spark. I was married at the time and I said, I, I said yes, but I thought about it a lot since. And I thought, well, what's a, what's a spark? A spark's a little a flash of light, a little fiery particle, but it burns out quickly. And uh, you know, you need, you need what you want is a fire and you want that spark to turn into something valuable, like a fire that'll give you warmth and light and nourishment. And, you know, that, I mean, I guess that that's, that's, you know, as far as these students and, and relating that to dentistry, you know, you want something, not just a, you know, a flash of passion, but you want to be, be thinking practically and, and trying to build something. Yeah. I mean, so much of life is just hard work. I mean, it's challenging every day and, um, you know, to, to, you need to set your expectations. I want to ask you another thing. Um, since you're from Texas, um, when I, um, when then you know I set my Google uh, search bar when I when I open up Google page it searches the keywords for dentist dentistry and it asks the twelve specialists and when the news comes up and it's printed by major newspapers or whatever um, I post it on Dental Town I mean it's a community and when it's bad thing about a dentist um, there was that dentist. Texas dentist charged with uh, a sexual assault or what have you. A lot of people always get mad and they say um, to me, um, why do you post that stuff? It just makes it look bad. And and I'm, I always respond because we don't live in a damn bubble. Your patients read it. Um, you ought to have a heads up. And, and I'm always thinking, um, you know, not all brains are normal and um, – um, you know, some, they say 1% are sociopaths. And, and when I, posted that one a long time ago. It was a Canadian who had a hidden camera in his bathroom. And I posted that. I got so many mean messages, you know, you know, why are you just destroying our image? And I said, because maybe there's some other idiot out there who right now has a camera in his staff bathroom and we'll see this in the headline news and decide to take it down. Sure enough, it wasn't even one year, not even one year, another dentist was busted for doing it. Um, but, but so I, should I stop posting the news of whenever a dentist gets arrested? Or do you th believe in transparency and that if it just saves one dumb dentist making a very bad decision, it's worth it? Where, where do you view on that? Is it just too negative, drop it, or keep doing I'd it? Love, I'd love to answer, but I got a hidden camera. I have to go disconnect. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I like stuff like that because I, I would like to hear it I'd like to have time to think about it before a patient asks me about it. So if it's in the news, I like seeing those things posted so I can have some time to kind of think about it and process it in case a patient does ask me about it. Fortunately, I don't, I don't think any have, but um, no, I, I, I'm all for sharing that because if it's in the news, we may as well be aware of it and form an opinion and be ready to answer questions. I'm surprised anybody would give you any blowback for that. It's not something that I've tuned into much over the years, but you know, that's what's kind of great about Dentaltown is there's, you know, dozens of different threads going on at any time about a, a very a different measure of, of subjects. So find the subject that works for you. If you enjoy posting that stuff, there are probably some people who enjoy reading it. That's great. Um, and it goes to, uh, I'll give you another example. You know, 
one of my classmates. I went to Creighton University, and uh, Paul um, Gosar, um, I was on the ninth floor at Swansea. He was on the eighth floor. I knew him all the way back to Creighton. He's in Flagstaff. But whenever he makes, like, the New York Times or, you know, these big stories, um, I post them. And then and then all my, uh, a lot of Arizona dentist friends, they call me out and say, you know, what, what do you have against Paul Gosar? Why are you... Why are you saying those mean things? I said I I've never said a word. I've never I've never typed one word about Paul Gosar. I just absolutely, you know, when the when the New York Times carries a story about a dentist, that's what Dental Town is. It's dentists. So if you're one of the five dentists that are at Congress, well, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna retweet your stories. Um, so how do you um, how do you view that? I mean, at least on Dental Town. <clears throat> politics is not on today's active topics. Like I saw uh, Greg's deal this morning um, on the today's active topics. I saw that myself. Um, but um, you know, politics is um, not on the today's active topics. You got to go to leisure and then type into it. But what do you think about sharing uh, news about you know um, the the five dentists in Congress? I think sharing that. I think sharing that information is great. I think that's what's cool about Dental Town. You know, put up what you want, and you know, there'll be like I said, there'll be an audience for it, and those who want to view it will see it. So I say more power to you than anybody else who wants to post something like that. Yeah, I agree. Anything, anything posted, nobody's obligated to read it or comment on it. If they don't want to be part of that conversation, then don't be part of that conversation. I always think it's funny when there's a thread and people are complaining about what people are posting. If you don't like it, you can feel free to go somewhere else. <laughs> But it's like so many people want to stay in a bubble. Like I even posted a, a post that started with NSW, not safe for work. And it was a oral surgery trauma. And um, um, the administrators immediately took it down. But on my text, when I had texted to Jay Resnick and other oral surgeons, I had the most interesting discussion because I was wondering, my gosh, um, you know, this person, I mean, I, I would be thinking, um, you know, loss of blood, loss of blood pressure, death. How, how do you manage an oral surgery emergency like that while you're also worried that the whole human's going to die. And I thought it was a fascinating discussion, but of course we couldn't have it on dental town because it had a bloody picture of a man who had a big boo-boo and it was bleeding. It's like, dude, are you not a doctor? I mean, what do you do? Live on it. Maybe you should peek under the rubber dam once a month uh, just to see that there's a human under that white pearly too and, and and the deal with um what i find most interesting about the gosar story uh is not even the political side i i grew up with that i mean my two oldest sisters uh, went straight into the nunnery and um and my youngest brother was born as gay as uh you know they come and so i saw that split over church and human sexuality, obviously, ghosts are family going through there. But I know all of you that ghosts are run with, and th- these are these are family issues and all issues. I, I bet you, I bet you, half the families in the United States at a family reunion have a religious divide, a political divide, a sexual divide, you know, all kinds of divides. And it, it, it's kind of a human story. Again, that's what I like about dental time. You can sort of have any, just about any discussion you want. I think that's cool. Unless it has a scary, bloody part to it. And then the doctors all get a, their panties caught up in their rear end. I mean, I, I, I just still am shocked. <laughs> hey, Howard, don't you have some control over that if you wanted to? Um, no, I don't because I don't have control over it because I'm a businessman. And I think uh, back, what I said earlier about stability. I mean, the number one economic driving force that we've learned since the Roman Empire is that stability allows people to make long-term investments and move to your area. And um, the only way you have stable employees is you don't micromanage them. You find a great person, and then Howard Goldstein's in charge of the message boards and continue ed, and I don't micromanage him for anything. And if I told him something, I don't even think he'd care. He And, and, and that's to have a, a great employee. He could retire tomorrow like you. I mean, I... Um, Lori, you know, been here 20 years. My office manager, Don's been here 20 years. And you can't keep great people by micromanagers. So I find the best people. I get the hell out of their way. Um, I can't get you on the cover of Dental Town. That's Tom Giacobbe. I can't get an article posted. Um, I am, um, no, I, I'm, that's, you know, either, it's like the office manager at work. Um, she's not an office manager. If you say no, and then she runs over to the dentist, 
and the dentist changes it, um, you know, you can't be responsible for something without the authority. And so when you say you're the office manager, here's the job description, and if you're responsible uh, for something, then you got to have the authority to change it. Like if I say I want this many new patients a month, you might need to spend more money on marketing. If I, um, you know, you just... So no, I don't. I don't give people um, responsibility and then um, take away their authority. Good answer. Makes sense. And it sounds like that's what you found at MB two. Very much. Yes. Very much. Yeah, I think I think that's what appeals to, to a lot of doctors who've partnered is they still run it like it's their show. They just have all the support they need and want. And if they don't want it, they don't have to take it. They just. I mean, it's there. So what part of Utah are you thinking about um, if you, you're, you're, you're going to? Well, Southern Utah, near near St. George, there's a little town called Washington. Uh, it's it's about 45 minutes from Zion National Park. Oh, trust me. It's the most awesome marathon you'll ever run. I did Ironman three years in a row, and there's two favorites. That one there is mostly downhill. I mean, that's very, what I heard. And then the, uh, the swim <laughs> in Louisville is downstream. You actually jump into a river that's flowing <laughs> down and have to swim your mile down. But uh, yeah, I just love that area. It is so damn gorgeous. In fact, driving from Phoenix all the way to Alberta was probably the coolest drive I've ever had in my life. But when you yeah. go there, um, do you, are you going to set up a dental office? No. No, when I when I when I leave this office, I think I'll be done with drilling teeth. So, and what age will that be? I'll be forty-eight. So my gosh, you guys are um, and, and your and your plan on retirement is when? Uh, in about a year. So, um, um, just uh, June twenty-second. Uh, well, yeah, twenty twenty-two. Uh, so yeah, well, yeah. late spring, early summer, twenty twenty-two. And you'll be how old? I'll be 48. So Two. you retired at 48. Phil retired at 51. I mean, that's got to be, I mean, you got to be the poster child dream of every dentist on dental town and every kid coming out with $400,000 of student loans. Um, so let's get back. I mean, I can't believe we uh, uh, just come up on an hour, but um, finances is the most important thing. And when people sit there and talk about how crazy the government spends, I'm like, well, yeah, everyone in the government came from your house. Your mom and dad made a baby and all those babies Babies are the 14 million people in the government, and they're actually financially more sound than their people. I mean, they're people, you give them a dollar, and it, like, catches their hand on fire, and they instantly go spend it. Um, it's always been my litmus test of uh, cousins and uncles and daughter-in-laws or whatever. You just, um, you know, you're having fun, dad, and you hear they're going to the mall, so you just, like, give them three Benjamins. And uh, if they come back and they got three pairs of designer Benjamins, I mean, it didn't even last an hour and they've converted it into something stupid, uh, you know, uh, their, their finances are going to be wreak havoc. But I want you guys to review and focus on what were your financial habits that you obviously had when we're all able to retire by 50 that you think so many dentists um, do not have uh, why um, hell I know a dentist just recently who's 60 who just bought a million dollar home in Scottsdale on a 30-year mortgage it's like dude are you working till you're 90 I mean so so review why you financially um, review your financial behavior that allowed this luxury to be done at 50. So I'll, uh, uh, can I go first I, I actually have patients waiting on me so maybe I can answer this and then turn you over to Phil and I, I actually have to run, but, um, for me, uh, I mean, I, I, so my dad was a school teacher. My mom stayed at home, seven kids. We grew up, you know, not a lot of money and I learned frugality. So I learned to, you know, live below my means and live on very little. And so I think, I mean, honestly, if you're coming out with half a million in debt, you're not rich, you know, so you need to live frugally. So that helped. I, I, I was, my parents didn't know much about investing or money management or any of that, but they, they, they taught me to get out of debt. And so I hit debt really hard, uh, initially. And as I was paying down my debt, I, um, learned about investing. And, and so I kind of 
I'm a, I'm a little bit different than Phil. I know Phil has a guy that he trusts that does everything and takes it off his shoulders and he'll tell you more about that. But I, you know, I've done a lot of my own just with index funds. And then I got into some rental properties about four years ago, uh, just more to diversify than anything else. Um, I've reinvested in MB2, but I think as far as the habits, it's really, you know, living below my means, and then all, and then also looking at the numbers, just practical things. Like I said, the advice I would give to these students is practical things. You know, look look at the numbers of the practice, and don't just look at you know which one has the you know fanciest equipment or or you know nicest to decor. Look at actually the numbers of the practice. That's what's going to determine your livelihood. So I was fortunate. I you know, I found a practice that was kind of a fixer upper, but the numbers were really good. And I, you know, took it and ran with it and we did better every year and, and, uh, eventually partnered with MB2 and that turned out to be, uh, profitable for me as well. And a good partnership. And it just set me up to be able to realize some of my other goals as far as doing things outside of dentistry. So. And, and one final thought for you, leave and go see patients on MB2. What would you say to the young kids, um, when they're looking for a job or a practice or MB2? Well, well, like I said, every, you know, it's different for everybody. One of the neat things is the guy that introduced me to MB2 actually had a practice out in your area initially that he owned and he was really struggling and he didn't know if he was going to go bankrupt or what. And so he ended up selling the practice, took a job as an associate at an at a office that was owned by an MB2 doctor out in Texas, worked there for a couple of years, did, did pretty well, kind of got back on his feet liked the model, the MB2 model and said, Hey, you know, I'm, I like the model. I've liked working as an associate. I'd like to get into ownership. And they said, okay, out here in West Texas, there's a couple practices where you can buy in as a part owner. So he bought like, I think it was 15 or 30% ownership in a couple of practices out here where I am. And he just helped those grow, got other associates. So within about six years, he went from a guy that thought he was going to go bankrupt to an associate to, to owning part of two very successful practices. And he financially, he's ahead of where I am. So, um, I mean, it, it can really help you reach your goals. If you know what your goals are, they're not going to tell you what to do, but they're going to support you in, in your vision and what you want to do, as long as it kind of coincides with what, what they, what they think would work well, but, but, uh, they're, they're just going to support you. And so for me, it's been fantastic. So, well, hey, thanks so much uh, for coming on the show, sharing your wisdom. It's been it's fun. An honor. Thanks so much. And uh, maybe sometime when I'm down in Beeville, I'll see you. <laughs> it's a little, bit, a little bit out of the way, but you can wave as you fly over. All <laughs> right. Have a good All one. Right. Okay. Take care. And Phil, how would you, um, how would you answer that? Um, what, how, how was your financial behavior different to allow you to retire at 51? I think, um, so you know, a little bit of a different upbringing, but we were always broke. My father was an attorney. And everyone thought, so uh, your, your dad's a lawyer, you're rich. And my parents never were. They made a nickel and, and spent a dime. And I grew up broke. I mean, we, and I, I was acutely aware of that as a kid. And I said, I'm, that's, I'm not doing that. I, I'm not taking that path. So we started ownership. We were, I think, 27 going on 28 and opened up a 401k plan by the time we were 29. And we invested about 20% of our pre-tax income from the time we were 29 until the time I was 50. And I think just being diligent about saving, making that a, an important part of your life. Um, that's half of it is saving. The other half is, you know, what do you do with that money? And I'm going to give Bob K on Dentaltown a shout out. I learned, again, I, I credit Dentaltown as being one of the sort of the quintessential things that has allowed me to retire at 51, believe it or not. I mean, I, I ran into Bob many years ago on, there's a 3% retirement thread that I guess only 3% of dentists can retire at 60. Or Kenny started that thread. And I ran into Bob and I just started reading and, and Bob's a financial wizard. He's, you know, posing as a dentist. I'm sure he's a great dentist, but he's a financial wizard. So, and I, then I, I learned a lot about it through Bob and then met my fine, my now financial advisor on Dentaltown, vetted him on Dentaltown. He just happened to pop on Dentaltown and, and I, I sort of latched to his wagon. So saving 20% and then, and then learning about finance and how to invest. That thread is uh, <clears throat> 3% can retire <clears throat> at 60. That thread is 546 pages long. And um, it was started by, uh, you, you say Kenny TC7. Is that who you meant? 
That is Kenny, yeah. Oh, well, I thought you called him Bob K or something. So Kenny started that thread, but the person that I sort of latched onto was Bob K. I, I, I'm sorry, Bob, if you're listening to this, I don't, I don't know how to pronounce your last name, but the guy, I, I just, I knew enough about investing to know that Bob knew what he was talking about, that he sort of stood out as the guy who you really want to latch onto. So instead of recreating the wheel, because I, I didn't, I didn't get my MBA or I didn't, I'm not a financial planner. I, I listened to the people who make the most sense. And Bob was that guy for me. Huh, and, and now Bob K, are you talking about um, Bob Ketzner? Is that how you pronounce Bob's last name? Could be. Uh, but that's what you mean by Bob K? Yes. Oh, okay, um, Ketzner, yeah. Uh, another amazing man. Um, and the so, guy's uh, a financial wizard. And, 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 you know, the secret to my success is, is investing 20%, again, and, and I, Bob has said this as well, if you can invest 20% of your pre-tax income from an early age, and I was fortunate enough to stumble upon a, a good practice. I mean, some of them, it's just, Dumb luck, you know. There was there were, dental town didn't exist, at least not to my knowledge, back in 1997 when I acquired my practice. So now, if you're looking at dental practices, you've got all these people who've done it before, and you, you can sort of pick their brain. I our our vetting of that practice was probably okay, but not great. We just got kind of lucky, so we found a, a lucrative practice with an honorable seller. So we started making a decent amount of money right off the bat, and I invested 20 percent of it, and now we're retiring. Wow. Yeah, Bob is. Um, um, there's so many amazing. I, I love Dennis. Um, my, my kids picked up on it early because I mean, there's only four pillars of knowledge so far. I mean, there's just uh, math, the language of the universe, uh, applied to physics, chemistry, biology. I mean, there's only four subjects, and uh, Dennis are highly trained in math, physics, chemistry, or biology. So they have the screwdriver, hammer, and the nail to. Uh, approach anything and my kids always notice that whenever they spent the night at a house and it was a dentist they had all these uh books in the library and if their dad wasn't a dentist uh they didn't have any books and there was no library and they just uh they just realized how smart dentists are and i told them it's the same with physicians and and um lawyers i mean uh, they're just readers but they're highly trained in science so if they put their mind to something they have the tools to really figure it out. And I just think they're just a, a cool uh, bunch of people. And I think you're cooler than school. I'm so uh, <laughs> excited that you uh, get to retire. You're going to move to Florida. It's just something that East Coasters do. By the way, in the international scene, if you're born and raised east of the Mississippi River, you go to Florida. And if you're west of the Mississippi or in Canada, you go to Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, and I don't know why on the East Coast they love humidity and insects and alligators when they could have come down to Arizona and didn't have any of those things. So why oh, did you pick? Arizona. Why did you, was it the ocean? Is that the attraction? Yeah. Yes. I, 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 um, I, I still can remember the first time I lectured in Florida and I um, walked out there in the backyard and I said, <clears throat> I couldn't figure out why they screen everything in. And he had this, would have had this nice view. And I'm like, why did, why did you screen this in? I mean, uh, you got such an amazing view. And he was looking at me like, uh, welcome to Florida. And oh my God, I never saw so many insects in my life. Are you prepared for the insects? We actually, the, the screen over our lanai and pool, they call it a cage, is actually being installed this month. So yeah. you're preparing for it. You're dead on. Oh, my God. And some of those, I mean, like where I grew up in Kansas, you're talking about little gnats and horse flies, whatever. There's shit flying around in Florida that's, you know, <laughs> two inches long with wings. It's like, it looks like it's related to a dinosaur or something. There's some crazy shit flying around down there. But, hey, uh, love Florida. Uh, by the way, you guys got another... Uh, um, um, congressional seat at the, the South. When you look at, I, I love the congressional seat every 10 years because it shows you where everybody's growing. And the trend is they're leaving the uh, rust belt in the Northeast and they're all going South and West. And so if you're a baby getting out of dental school, <clears throat> the long-term demographic trend in America has been going South and West for ever since the gold rush of 1869. So um, uh, have you picked a city down there? We have we own a house in Naples. Oh, Naples! Wow. So, uh, so then, um, gosh, that's just gorgeous. So that's on the Gulf side of mm -hmm. the tip of Florida, and um, so um, you won't get hit by a right hand hurricane punch. You'll just get that upper left uppercut if it hooks back. Are you worried about the hurricanes? Um, I try not to worry too much about things out of my control. I mean, we've got insurance and all that stuff, and I don't, my house isn't directly on the water, but. Uh, when was it? A couple of years ago, there was a huge scare. We thought that our our house might get 
put under six feet of water. So it's definitely something that's in the back of your mind, but what are you going to do? Well, I mean, you're a dentist. You could actually figure out the hundred year flood level and raise the house. I mean, you, you, I mean, they make airplanes out of a little, a little couple millimeters of aluminum that go through 500 miles an hour. Um, I always thought it was funny. It's like, why do airplanes from Boeing not blink at 500 mile an hour wind? Uh, but a house with a hundred, I mean, it seems pretty easy to make, a house a lot more protective than not. The bigger problem where we live isn't so much the wind. I think they've got that down pretty well. It's the um, it's really the flooding. It's the water level that they're concerned about. So you'd have to put everything on stilts. You'd have to pop it up ten feet or so, and that just hasn't happened. But some of my friends um made the um all their like their um man cave and all their electronics and uh, basically the first level uh, was basically a garage and dry goods and so they, they've kind of written off that if it floods out the first level they didn't really lose anything and everything of value is on floor two and above are you going to do that strategy i guess i'm screwed on that front because we live in a ranch <laughs> one level oh okay yeah all right well hey man uh, are you gonna do anything dental down there probably not wow what a well-rounded man um congratulations on an outstanding career and from the bottom of my heart thank you for sharing so many um, of your thoughts on Dental Town for so many years. I mean, 60,000 posts. Because um, you got to remember, humans, um, uh, for all social media, I, I've read the research from Facebook and all that. And, and nine out of 10 people, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, it doesn't matter, nine out of 10 don't post a damn thing. Only 1% are original content creators. And then 9% chime in, LOL, agree, disagree, get in a fight, whatever the hell. But nine out of ten say nothing, and I know those nine out of ten dentists think, and it, it just frightens them. And um, uh, even coming on this show, I mean, I'm surprised I've had this many guests because the majority, um, when I uh, ask, they they just laugh like, "Are you kidding me? No way!" And uh, that's why it's not live. You know, that gets more people to come on. But um, why do you think? Why why could you just share every damn thought you've had? 60,000 times and nine out of 10 people on dental town won't even hit reply and say yes or no. I just think it's who I am. I mean, I, I, you know, I don't have a psych degree either, but I just think that's, it just comes natural for me. It's not something that I'm not nervous about sharing my opinion. But they're always uh, uh, frightened that someone's just going to disagree and then they won't like you or love you anymore. I guess I just don't give a shit. (laughs) Is, Is that Do you think that's where it really comes from that you just... For me, yeah. I mean, I'm just uh, trying to be as honest. I try and be as much as me as uh, this is who I am. You know, the person people read on Dental Town is who I am and take it or leave it, I guess. Uh, And now, just just scared not to get personal, but now would your wife have the same view? Would would she like not give a shit and care and post all other or would she? She thinks I'm an idiot for spending so much time on Dental Town. She would never do it. So she wouldn't waste the time, but, but what about the personal like... If someone, you know, replied back and said, she thinks, she thinks I have an unusual amount of frankness and maybe too much self-confidence. That and where, would be her words. And what do you, where do you think that comes from? Um, I haven't the slightest idea. I don't know. I just, I, it's who I am. It would be unnatural for me to spend, you know, an hour or two hours a day on dental town and not respond. Cause I feel like I'm having a conversation with people. And if I'm going to have a conversation, well, then I've got to, you know, type on the keyboard, keyboard and have a conversation. I, I can't, I feel like I'm part of a, you know, a conversation, I guess is what it is. And, and that's a two way street or on dental town, a 10 way street or however many people are participating. I, I, I can't imagine myself being a lurker because I'd want to participate. And final question, final question. Um, all animals, uh, well, I mean, what, what we're talking about, uh, all animals chose camouflage. Um, governments don't like transparency. I mean, when Snowden came out and showed you just a little piece of what they got in there, you would think all the people would say, hey, put everything you got on Wikipedia. I mean, every animal chose camouflage, opaque, I'm going to hide in a cave. No one wants to be transparent. No one wants to come out and say that. And um, I just, uh, I just love it. Um, when, I mean, you're, you're like the anti-camouflage action hero. I mean, just, I mean, you're, you're like, uh, in the middle of the jungle dressed up as where's Waldo, not giving a shit that every animal in there, uh, wants to eat you for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And man, I, I, I just love that about you. Um, um, my gosh, it's just, uh, 
that deep transparency. Do you think it was that your mom made you that way? Your dad? Uh, again, you know, it's not something I've given a ton of thought to. It's just, I don't, I just know that's who I am. I'm the same person in my, in my life outside of dental town as I am on dental town. That's, you know, I've got, we've got lots of friends. We're very social people. And I think all of my friends would say I am as outspoken in my real life as I am on dental town. It's just who I am. And, and I don't know that I have much control over it. Hmm. And another thing, um, the research was really interesting is difference between Facebook and Google. Um, Facebook is your alter ego. Here I am at dinner with my perfect dog and cat and wife and beautiful house. And then you're on Google, which is true serum. Uh, how do you kill your spouse and not get caught? The divorce attorney. So Google is like um, you, you talk to it like you talk to God. Uh, you know, help me. And in Facebook, it's just this big fake eminence front that even 90% of the people on Facebook aren't going to share anything. And you are just the complete opposite. You use it as a tool that conquers time and distance to communicate and you share all your thoughts. And uh, man, thank you so much for all you've done for uh, not just dentistry, but for Dental Town. And I hope to hell you enjoy your retirement and in Naples. Thank you, Howard. I appreciate it. All right, man. Have a good day. All right. Good night. 